All right, welcome back, everybody. We lost power there for a second. And, and welcome to the nice, fancy facilities in our distance ed program. We will not be meeting here every week, but we thought it might be nice for the first class to give you the introduction to the course. Um, everybody remember Dr. Gross? So we will be co-teaching this class, and we have a couple of stragglers that aren't here yet. Um, so if you are in there or end up in their groups, please pass on this information to them. But what we want to go through is some of the outcomes of today, specifically what, are, what do we want to get from this course this semester, uh, the format and how we're going to conduct the course, and what the requirements are for you guys in terms of your deliverables. Give you a little bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar with Amigos de Jesus, the site, uh, the surrounding area identify those that were involved uh, from Amigos and from Villanova in terms of starting the orphanage and introduce you to the clients. Identify the site layout and talk about very briefly the development at the site from 1997 when the orphanage was founded through last year. And then talk about the piece or the role that you're going to play this year in terms of the, the actual project the design side and the construction side. So as far as what we want to, to get through um, in today's lecture, obviously we want to go through the objectives and requirements of the course and then give you that general in introduction to Honduras, Amigos de Jesus, the boys at the orphanage, um, the history, specifically what the site looks at, like and obviously an important element of what your project is going to be this year, which has um, changed since we passed out that description or emailed you that description at the end of last semester. As far as this particular course, Capstone 2, real world is the key. We want to complete a design to a specific engineering discipline, ours of course being structural engineering. We want to apply current technology, design codes, design software, in the practice of structural engineering, and then effectively communicate the outcomes of your project through reports, um, plots, materials data, um, and obviously at the end of the semester you need to present your material, so in the verbal form. Our course is going to focus on a one-story masonry building, so we want to come up with a complete structural design, so that means all the calcs and background, as well as final drawings so that it can be built. Your structure is going to be a piece or one of the buildings within the school complex at Amigos de Jesus. So this has changed from, we had said that we might be doing a dormitory building or the client um, pushed up the timetable in terms of the designs for the school. So this became their new priority. And since that's our client's priority, that is now your priority in terms of what we are going to do. We'll talk about that in a little more detail um, near the end of class. As far as the requirements go, this is going to be a group project. There is supposed to be, although there's not today, 14 people in this course, which means we're going to have two groups of five and one group of four. Criteria for the groups are you will have one person that is the project manager per group, and they will be responsible for the communications with Dr. Gross and myself and perhaps people at the site. You have to have at least one person in your group going to Honduras at spring break. You can have everybody in your group going to Honduras, that's fine, but you have to minimally have at least one person that will serve as your site representative. You should have at least two people in your group that took foundation engineering based on what I think most of you took, that shouldn't be a problem. You should come up with a group name and letterhead by the end of this week. And all groups must meet this criteria and everybody in the class must be satisfied with the groups. So you get to pick your own groups. If anybody is not happy with the groups, contact Dr. Gross or myself and Dr. Gross and I will tell you what the groups are going to be. All right, so it's in your best interest to come to a mutual decision at the end of class today, determine what those groups are going to be. Attendance is mandatory at all classes, unless you're excused prior to class by one of us. 
There is a course fee for all of the capstone courses, not just the structures one. And that fee will cover things like having to buy new codes and structures, cylinder molds and structures, some of the testing things that we will do throughout the semester. Um, but that money gets put towards expenses that are incurred in the capstone courses. And there are no textbooks that you have to buy for this class. The idea behind the group effort is that you are individual teams. So you have three groups, three individual teams. You're responsible for working at your own pace, meeting the goals that are set throughout the semester. Um, you, are in, you are required to keep meeting minutes of all the meetings that you have as a group. Let me make this clear that there's, I think I have made it clear that there's a lot of work and a real client in this project. If you choose for whatever reason, which I don't foresee happening, but to not participate within your group based on your fellow group members and the faculty decision, um, you will be expelled from this class. So second semester senior year, capstone is not the time to stop working because you can only take this class. It would be again next fall or next spring, excuse me. There will be four progress reports, written reports throughout the semester. Each, with each progress report will be a presentation. There will also be a presentation following the return from Honduras. Um, so each group member is responsible for giving the presentation. So everybody will present at least once during the semester. Um, that doesn't mean whoever's presenting is responsible for the written report. That is a, a group responsibility. Are there any questions on either the group requirements or the course requirements? OK. Prior to each meeting, if you read your syllabus, and please do read your syllabus, you are required to give myself and Dr. Gross a copy of the agenda of the meeting. You guys will be leading the meetings, so make sure that we are provided plenty of notice in terms of what we are going to be discussing. Here is a tentative schedule um, based on clients' needs, our needs, and your needs. Um, we may move some of these dates around. So this is a tentative schedule of when the progress reports would be due. Note that they, are, they tend to be front-loaded in the semester based on the fact that we need to get a certain amount of design done prior to going on the trip so we can start construction. Grading, there will be an individual component based on the work that you do in presenting and evaluation by your group members is 20%. Progress reports and presentations will count 30%. Your final presentation is 20%. Your final report is 30%. If done properly, the progress reports, you should basically be able to put them together, making the edits that we have are the com incorporating the comments that Dr. Gross and I have made and put together the final report. So it, the big effort is in putting together the progress reports, not the final report. As far as the format goes, in the past couple of years, we've found that these tend to be, at least the class meetings, tend to be Dr. Gross and I just giving you information with very little interaction in terms of you asking questions or the students asking questions. Um, and really, once you get into the design work is when the questions came up. So the idea for this semester, what we're going to try and do, is Dr. Gross and I have pre-recorded a lot of the material that you need to do your design and a lot of the background information from the site. So the idea is that you're going to have this information available to you via WebCT. You can watch them at your own pace. And then as needed, we will add some more of those. Then our class meeting time will be the two of us and the individual groups. So we'll meet with a group, the two professors. And that time is for you to ask us questions or to give us updates on you know, the progress that your group has made. So the, inter the, the class time will be a third of which will be devoted to your specific group will be you know, five or four of you talking with the two of us. All right, so that's going to be the format. 
Um, it, come next week, all of the, the video files will be in a format that you can download to your computer, or for those of you that got the video iPod for Christmas, you can download your lectures. I don't know why you would want to, but you can watch Dr. Gross speaking on your, on your iPod about materials testing um, information for Honduras. So that will be, I don't know if we officially become part of the iTunes University, but we'll be set up for that format. So we'll have the weekly meetings. We'll talk about the progress, questions, any changes that you suggest, any changes that the client has come up with to us, which does happen, um, updates in terms of the status from the site, and if we need to schedule additional meetings, um, we can absolutely do that too. All right, any questions on the course format? All right, as you are well aware, um, you know what civil engineers do. And there's, there's a big piece of what we do that essentially is you know, what we can call service. So your job is to protect and serve society. Um, oftentimes, in, in trying to develop a, a senior project, um, you come up with that, that real world element. Well, generally, it's a, a pretend project or a real project, but you are doing the pretend work. Um, I think this project is unique, and Dr. Gross and I have looked around at what other programs do. We've never seen a project like this where the students are actually doing the design, doing the construction for a real client with real deliverables that truly fits under the category of, of service. So it's a, it's a unique project. It's a, it's a unique opportunity. Along the way, um, we're going to learn about a different culture, um, a very poor culture. Um, and you're going to see that we have some very special clients that we are serving. And to gauge some of the outcomes of the class, we ask, actually we require that you fill out a pre-course survey. How many people have filled out the survey already? All right, so one of your assignments is if you have not filled out the survey is to complete that um, by the end of today. And that link is off of Dr. Gross's homepage. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gross for a couple of minutes to give you the background of exactly where we are, are going in terms of where Honduras is. Okay, thank you, Dr. Deinhardt. Um, we figured uh, you're going to hear enough, and you certainly have heard enough from Dr. Deinhardt for uh, the last several semesters. So I'm going to take all of about five minutes uh, as part of this lecture and then hand it back over to Dr. Deinhardt. And this, the sole purpose here is to try and get you oriented as far as um, where our site is. Now, uh, there's a funny story that always goes along with this. If we go back to 2000, uh, we didn't know anything about the site. We were told, of course, it's in Honduras. It's uh, near a town called Postas Verdes. And what we did is uh, had Dr. Deinhardt type that in uh, to his computer, uh, went through MapQuest, got a nice map of Honduras, and there is, of course, a star uh, where the site was. Well, it wasn't until we got there that we realized that it didn't know where Postus Veritas was. It simply put a star right smack in the middle of the country. We wound up about 250 miles from where we thought we were. Uh, and so since that point, we, we've tried to uh, convey a little better exactly where we're going. And this is going to be important for a lot of what you do, particularly in the first couple of weeks, with, with trying to come up with seismic loads and, and some things related to geography, wind loads, et cetera. So, Quickly here, kind of going through, I think we can all recognize uh, Google Earth and uh, where we are on the screen. We're basically uh, sitting in the Sear building. We'll kind of fast forward back out here. And I think we probably all have a pretty decent idea where Honduras is, at least I hope we do, as we kind of go from a view of North and Central America and focus down on this, this Rather small country. It's actually a country about the size of Tennessee, uh, for those of you that are keeping track. 
you can see Honduras is basically going to be bordered by three different countries. It's going to be bordered by Guatemala uh, to the north and more precisely to the west, El Salvador to the southwest, and then Nicaragua uh, down to the southeast. Now, where we're located is basically on the screen. Uh, you can see Amigos de Jesus. The site is located right here, pretty close to the Guatemalan border. I'm going to go through and give you a little bit better view. The country of Honduras is broken up into what we call departments. Okay? They would be analogous to what you might think of as a state uh, in this country, although they're probably a lot closer to the size of counties. Uh, the province that we're talking about here is the province of Santa Barbara. If you look at a map of Honduras, you can see again it's very close to the Guatemalan border where the site is. Uh, it is not too far from the city of San Pedro Sula. And we're actually going to start the tour quickly there. Uh, if you do fly into Honduras with us, you will fly into San Pedro Sula. We're going to start to look a little closer at the geography and, and what the terrain looks like here. You'll fly into the San Pedro Sula airport. If we zoom back out and just look at the uh, general size there, you'll see up toward the top of the screen there is a lot of a uh, densely populated area. San Pedro Sula is the second largest city in Honduras, and it's what we would call the economic capital uh, of the country. So much of the uh, activity is centralized there and in Tegucigalpa, which is in the center of the country and happens to be the capital. Now, if you look here, there is a river that stretches along right in here. That is the Chamelecon, and if you do uh, participate in the trip. You will take a bus ride. It takes us along that river. Bus ride is about an hour, uh, maybe an hour and a half, I, I think is probably a better, uh, a better time. And you'll go west along that river, pretty much following it the whole way until we get to the area uh, where we get close to the site. And we will get off of the road <coughs> at the town of La Flecha. Now, Part of the reason for showing you this is to show you the terrain, and if you take a look at it, there is not a lot of densely populated area anywhere along that river basin. Okay? It's a pretty desolate drive for the most part until we get to this area. Now here's Amigos, and if we look at this area right in here where the uh, cursor is, this area is where we're going to leave the road. There is a river here that's the Chamelecon, as I said. And then if we look up here, there is another river that is a tributary. It's not the Chamelecon, but it's a, it's a pretty uh, decent-sized river, uh, maybe 100 feet across, that we will go to and from the town of Macaliso uh, as necessary. So if we, we focus in just on the Amigos area now, you've got an idea overall. Again, I'll zoom out just to show you how close it is to the Guatemalan border. It's the easiest way to locate it. And it's actually about six miles, uh, somewhere six to seven miles from the Guatemalan border, which is the big yellow line there. If we zoom in now on the area itself, you're going to see there are going to be two towns that are pretty close to Amigos. And there's a couple other maps that I'll mention that you have access to uh, through WebCT. Both of those maps are going to have these two towns on that. So if you're trying to locate it via the maps, it is going to be easiest for you to look at this town right here, which is Asaqualpa. And then there's a town right down here, directly across the, the river from Amigos, which is Macuiliso. Those two towns are on the maps, okay, where we leave the, the road in La Flecha and some of the other surrounding area are not. Now, there is a satellite image up there for you with those two things labeled, so you don't need to worry about how to spell them and all of that now. We zoom in a little closer on the Amigos site. Unfortunately, because we're talking about uh, Honduras here and not in the city of San Pedro Sula, there's only so close that we can get with this to actually look at it. But again, you can see the two towns. And you'll see that the Amigo site is roughly uh, about a mile or so to Macaliso. So Macaliso is right here directly across the river. If you look at most of this area, the color should tell you something. Okay. The color over here should tell you something as well. As we look to the right on the map or to the east of the site, uh, we get back into the hills or, or rather low mountains. Okay? There's mountains along the Guatemalan border, uh, but the Amigos site sits right at the edge of this river basin. 
Okay, so it's a fairly low-lying area uh, that I believe is really about uh, five, six hundred feet, uh, last we were able to tell above sea level. It's hard to get, get too close. So that's where we're headed. Okay, now uh, if I just kind of zoom back out to give you one last look, you can see again the proximity of San Pedro Sula from this map. Okay, so as you go through, there will be no excuses for coming up. Dr. Deinhardt's laughing because we go through it every year. There will be no excuses for not coming up with good data on what things like ground accelerations are. How close are we to, to being in a high seismic area? Or are we in a high seismic area? How far are we from the coast for wind purposes? Those sorts of things. You know, what are we surrounded by? Is it, is it all mountains around there? Those are the types of things that, that we want you to do with this data. Okay, so at this point we're going to go back. I'm just going to give you one um, quick summary as to what's on our, on our uh, web CT site and what you have access to. And the first thing that we're actually going to have is the availability of um, a Google Maps file. Okay. A Google Maps file uh, is going to be a .kmz file. There's going to be a WebCT folder. Actually, there already is a WebCT folder that has this information up there. If you want to locate the site, all you have to do is go make sure you have Google Earth somewhere on some computer. It's easy. It's a free download. Download that KMZ file, and it will give you a marker where that Amigo site is, so you don't have to even look for it. Um, there are some satellite images extracted with a couple of labels that I added on, same stuff that we just looked at, but with some labels. There are also three maps available, one of the Santa Barbara province, and then two maps that should help you with other things. It's a climate map and a terrain map of Honduras. Okay, All of those are available on WebCT through this maps and satellite images.zip. Okay? The official coordinates you can take for purposes of all being on the same page are shown there. That'll agree with what you have in the Google Maps file. The last thing I want to leave you with before I hand it back over to Dr. Deinhardt is to give you some sense of scale. We just saw this image to the right. Uh, this is basically the, the Amigo site with the town of Macaliso to the side or across the river uh, to the left on the screen. So here's Macaliso. And if we look at this, we all should know what this area is. This is the Villanova campus, and that's highlighted for you. And this is purely to give you a sense of scale. Okay, This is scaled off where one mile, you can see down here, is about that distance. And if we were to overlay the entire Villanova campus, so I'm talking not just the main campus, but everything, Okay, the, the athletic field, south campus, uh, west campus, and all of that, over Macaliso, you see what it looks like. And that's as close as we can zoom in, as I said, to get any resolution. But you can see it's going to be about the same size. So when we talk about this town that's close by, that'll give you some sense of scale what we mean by a town. It's not a town of 500 people. It's also not a town of 500,000 people. Okay, so you can put it into perspective just based on size. Okay, typical densities, you'll see a couple of pictures and some of the other stuff we're going to look at. Okay, so with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Deinhardt. All right, so if we look at Amigos de Jesus, or Friends of Jesus, it was started or founded in, in the late 90s by a group of people, really four people. Father O'Donnell, who is from the Philadelphia area, used to be at the Melbourne Retreat House. Sister Teresita, a Honduran nun. Christine and Anthony Granice. Anthony Granice being the one who contacted Villanova in 2000. He was a class of 1990 civil engineer and wanted to develop the relationship of Amigos with Villanova University structural engineers in particular. Um, maintained by the director from Honduras, Ubil, um, padrinos or the kind of like the step parents or foster parents of the children that live on site and now a series of U.S. volunteers 
uh, one of those volunteers has gone on to become the U.S. director, again, civil engineer from Villanova, who participated in this class a few years back. So here is Sister Teresita, Anthony and Christine Granice, Father O'Donnell, and this gentleman is Ubio, who started as a foreman on site for the first couple of years and then transformed into the man who is now the Honduran director. To date, we've had four of our students that have volunteered for long-term commitments at the site. Um, and this fellow here, you may remember from helping out in your labs, um, Jeff Cook, who is actually currently at the site. And so those of you who go down will have to bring him a treat this year. Now, as far as our clients and who we are really working for this year, And I think the, the resolution on this isn't great, but we're going to put it on the web so it should stream fine for you guys. Um, but essentially, your clients are children that don't have anybody to take care of them. Either their parents are dead, or their parents choose not to take care of them, or their parents would like to take care of them and can't afford to. And so Amigos, while they have the home for boys, they financially support um, girls' orphanages too and individual family units. Um, and the long-term plan is to have both boys and girls at this site, hence the, the dormitory projects that are in the future. So these really are the people that you are working for and will be working for this semester. So please keep that in mind. So here's a, a couple of shots from a few years ago. You can tell because I know this guy here in the green is actually taller than me now. And Dr. Gross looks a lot younger over here. And this is actually, this photo was just taken about a month ago of one of the little girls that's going to the school there. The, the school that you are actually building, well, designing and helping to construct the computer lab for. The boys are hard workers. They love pitching in. And it is an amazing experience for people that have been multiple years, like Dr. Gross and myself, who watched these guys grow up. This was in 2000, and he. And there's always one smallest, most adorable kid. He was him in 2000, and this is him now. I think back of my own experience. Again, this was 2000, and I can just um, remember this boy wasn't living at the orphanage at the time. And I just remember seeing him and thinking, I don't want to touch this kid. He was so dirty. And unbeknownst to me, he soon started living at the orphanage. And, and then in subsequent years, to watch how he changed and, and watch how he, I mean, you can see the misery in his face in 2000. And then living at this place, um, the effect that it had on him over the, over the last few years. And so if you want the, the latest update on who the, the, the youngest and the cutest is, that's Gerson. So you may have the opportunity to meet him. And as far as what we've been able to do, um, and it's been a privilege to be able to do it, is, is Villanova, is, and it's Gross and I do very little. It's, it's you guys that do all of the work. Um, and out on WebCT is a very detailed history of what we've been able to do. Um, here is a, the Cliff Notes version of that. But when we started in 2000, um, the first project was building a cross at the top of the hill. At that time, this building was complete. That's an administrative building. And we'll do a, a site walkthrough in just a second. This building here is the dormitory for the boys, and that was under construction. So that's in 2000. Um, we selected, or they initiated the contact with us. And at first, we were thinking they wanted us to do a masonry building. Gross and I said, well, there's no way we could do a masonry building. Our students don't even take a masonry course. And they said, well, we want you to do a cross this year. So absolutely after that, then they came back and we said, we want you to do a split level masonry building. And Gross and I said, oh, no problem. Our students can do that. So here's the site where they wanted the chapel and the volunteer center. That's after the first year. It's a three-year project. Uh, 
That's what it looks like now. Villanova and other U.S. volunteers now live in that structure, and this top floor serves as a chapel. Well, that was only one structure, so we figured we could take on more now. So then came the idea of a school complex, a series of eight buildings. No problem. Give us three years. We can work that out, too. Classroom buildings, administrative building for the faculty, um, bathroom, restroom facilities, and then some specialty buildings. So we've got eight buildings on the site. Administrative building and the classroom building actually are being used now. The school is open. Um, foundations for the bathroom building were completed. I think a couple of people from this class actually helped dig those and pour those. Um, the design is being done by Jeff, who's down there right now. Um, the design of the two buildings, two of the specialty buildings, um, were completed last year. And 10 of those foundations for the second classroom were built. What's left is one of the specialty buildings, which became a new priority on Amigo's list within the last month, and that is to get an operational computer lab. The plan is to have the building done and operational by the end of the summer. So as far as looking at our site and getting you familiar with not only the topography of the site, but the layout of the buildings, and I have to thank a, a local um, architecture firm um, for these great graphics. It's, it's not that Dr. Gross didn't do a great job putting together a 2D sketch, but um, this firm put together um, a site. So this is the main entrance of the building, or of the site, this gate you know, that, where that bridge is. And you can see the two buildings, the admin building, and the, the kind of the curved building there is the dormitory. And the soccer field, as you move to the left, the soccer field, you move to where the school complex is. And those two buildings that are there are actually the ones that are part of the school complex that are being used already. So we've got the main gate and the administration building as you enter. We've got the dormitory and the dining hall. You've got the volunteer house. And you've got the cross. The cross project was 2000. The volunteer center was the next three years worth of designs. They didn't let us design the soccer field. Then we've got the school buildings that are two in place and operational right now. So that gives you the status of where they are. And these next photos or pictures will walk you through what they want to do. They want to expand to about 200 boys and girls from around 50 right now. So they need the school complex completed. They need a bigger dining room. And they need additional dorms. One of the visions is to put in a nice new bridge connecting the new dorms to the existing um, common area and putting in a new chapel. And so the next fly through kind of walks you through what their vision of when it's all completed, with a lot of design work from the Villanova engineers, um, what the infrastructure will look like, I guess probably three or four years from now. Got the new dormitory and dining hall. So we're going to blow out the back of that so we can accommodate maybe 180 hungry little eaters. If we walk around the soccer field, we're going to move the wood shop, which is now in the basement of the administrative building. We're going to move that out here so there's access, direct access to the road and a place to store their lumber. And the boys will learn the trade of woodworking, for those that are interested anyway. And we are going to complete the school project. Right now, that first building is the admin building. And the building to the left is the first classroom building that's been constructed. We're going to put in two more classroom buildings at the base of that hill. The specialty buildings will be located across the quad on the right. That last building being placed right now, that's the computer lab. So that building on the far right will be the building that you're designing. You come up over the hill, 
I'm going to pass over the cross and go over the volunteer center. That blue is not a river. It is a small stream that is usually dry when we are there in the spring. And across that in a pretty flat field would be the new boys' dorm for older boys, which would make room for then younger girls to move into the existing dormitory. And following construction of that would be another dormitory. Um, and the dormitory would be split into um, age groups into 24-bed dorm and a 12-bed dorm on either wing with padrinos that live in the building as well. So right next door would be um, the dormitory as the little girls got older, then they would move into this dormitory. One of the, the gentlemen who's played a significant role in terms of funding the orphanage, um, his daughter, whose name was Kelly, um, was killed a few years back. And he's one of the contractors who's been to the site, um, hence the, the bike rider, to signify his contributions. Then we want to tie in this, because it is a little bit removed from the, the common area now, is to come back over the creek with a bridge, more of a signature type structure, and then ultimately put in a new chapel to serve the whole community at the base of the hill under the cross, where you could then see the cross from inside the chapel. So that is where they want to go. And so your role really is, you know, we are, you are along probably maybe a little over midway through this vision. And your piece is an important one in terms of completing the design for the school complex. So here is. AutoCAD rendering of the site. And this includes, if you look at this, is the administration building and the current dormitory. You can see this would be the additional flow out of the dining room. These are the new dorms. Cross is located up here. Walk through the soccer field. That brings us over to school complex, which that is the administration building, and that is the classroom building that's completed. This building here is the building that you will be designing. So that, this is administration building, classroom, your building. And this is a layout, a sketch by the architect at the site, essentially building H here. And I think it's labeled as a library on this picture, is actually going to be the building that, that, that you can design and construct. Give you a little bit of a reference. Um, and these are architecture sketches that I had to paste together. Um, but that's the landscaping that you saw in the fly through in terms of what the ultimate product will look like with this being your building, which is a little smaller footprint. Um, than the other specialty buildings. This is what the site looked like. The cross is actually on the other side of the hill. And it should serve as a reference point for you. The entrance is really over here. So this was what it looked like prior to starting construction, any construction. This is what it looked like day one when we got there to start the classroom building. And you can see the first thing that we had to do was actually get rid of the, the ground vegetation. Students took that picture that Dr. Gross put together in consultation with Amigos. And as of this year, actually the end of last year, that building was complete in school and the children were attending classes there. So that gives you a very quick overview of the projects that we've done um, and hopefully the history of where we've been. There is detailed information provided um, in video form on WebCT. So you can walk through the early years, the volunteer center chapel, and the initial um, phases of the school complex. Along the lines of the presentations, not only is the history, but also talks about some of the design challenges 
and some of the construction challenges associated with each of the projects. So hopefully it'll give you some insight in helping you um, towards your project. There also will be out there for you typical construction practices. Um, they like to do certain things certain ways. Um, and as the engineers, you have to respect that and accommodate your designs to those methodologies. Um, also, there are some differences between the U.S. and Honduran in terms of not only the construction practice, um, but also the material quality and availability. Um, there's been a lot of testing that's been associated with the work that's been done over the years. Um, your group will obviously continue that and provide more information. There's also um, that information is available to you when selecting material strengths. Um, all of that will be available by the end of today. So you have a starting point there. Um, additionally, we're going to add lectures on building systems, of which you've seen a little bit from advanced structures. Um, we're going to talk about, again, an overview of codes in terms of wind load and seismic load. And you will get an introduction into masonry design. Those will try to have up there by um, the 22nd. Additionally, beyond that, there will be some more lectures on masonry design, um, a brief lecture on roof design, some considerations, foundation design, although there will be people from each group that know how to design foundations, and some talk about ground slab design as well. All right, any questions about anything that we've covered so far? All right, so you will have all of that information as needed, and if there's something else that we need to talk about as a class, we can always have a meeting in here that we can schedule. Or again, if it's something small, five-minute thing that one group is interested in that we cover, Dr. Gross and I will come in here, talk about it for five minutes, put it up on the web so that all the groups have access to it. All right, I think hopefully you've gotten the impact that this is going to be um, not your ordinary project. And if you are interested in going to Honduras over spring break, you have some questions, um, absolutely please come and see us. Uh, I will say don't let financial considerations be the reason to stop you from going. Um, also, how many people have been to the site? Raise your hand, please. So there's three people in class that you can talk to. Um, about their experiences if you have any questions. All right, as far as work tasks go, pick your groups now before we leave. Um, and I believe based on my count, there are, because Kmart's not here, so that's 15 people in the class. Is that correct? I counted right? So that means we have three groups of five. After you've got your groups, everybody's happy. If you have not filled out the survey that I put the link up for on this presentation, please go do that. And as a group, you can then start researching structural engineering in Honduras. Codes, standards, specs. Dr. Gross threw out a good one in terms of wind speeds and ground accelerations. Anything that may be helpful in starting your design. You need to pick a firm name up with a letterhead and then watch those videos that will be up there by the end of today. So your deliverables in terms of what you need to finish and when. 15 completed surveys, your groups, names of the site representatives if possible. There may be a group that you know one or two people are still thinking about going and they're not sure who that is going to be. And then Friday correspondence to myself and Dr. Gross introducing your firm, who your project manager is, and who will be traveling to Honduras with myself and Dr. Gross. And then on Monday, we will meet individually as groups, and we'll post the times on WebCT, but have, which I'm sure you will have lots of questions that we, you want us to send to the client or questions that you have for us. Um, many of which we will probably be able to answer, many of which we will probably have to um, contact the site. Course fee is due on Monday, and 
check is made payable for whatever I said on the syllabus. And the final commitment to travel to the site um, really needs to be taken care of um, by Monday. And again, don't let financial considerations, the fact that you need shots, um, the fact that you don't have a passport, things like that, we have overcome all of it in the past. Um, so if, if you really want to go, um, we'll figure out how to get you there. All right. The estimate, I will say in, our rec in trying to attain funding, I will say it costs about $1,000 to go. Um, in reality, it's probably closer to $800. That includes getting shots. Um, really what happens in terms of the fundraising that we've been able to do in the past, the true costs probably are between zero and $300. That doesn't mean they will be this year, but that's past trips, Aaron. That information for tomorrow or Friday. Like, yeah, and, and, if, but if, and if finances, which I know are a real concern, please come and see us. We can talk about it in more detail. All right, any other questions? All right, I will leave you to decide on what the groups are, and don't, for, don't forget, I think there's a one or two people that can speak for Kmart, so um, good luck. Thanks, Dan. <laughs>